Good afternoon, everybody. Good afternoon. Um, it's now just about eight bells, I guess. Uh, for those of you who don't know me, I'm John Pantangelo, the managing director here at the museum. Uh, John Kennedy sends his regrets. He is probably uh, he's making his way towards the Inca ruins in Chile right now. Um, but he'll be back in a couple of weeks. Um, welcome today's, to today's Eight Bells Lecture. Uh, to check up on upcoming lectures, you know you can check our Facebook page at uh, www.facebook.com slash Naval War College Museum, <coughs> or uh, just give Kelly your email and you can receive uh, regular emails on um, uh, upcoming lectures. Up next, on September 26th, we will have Oliver Hazard Perry in the Temple of Fame by Stephanie Ako. And then on the 3rd of October, we will have Congo, The Miserable Expeditions and Dreadful Death of Lieutenant Emery Taunt, USN. And that book is about a young naval officer who was given the mission to explore the Congo River in May 1885, and he's tasked with reporting on opportunities for American business interests. The trip, which had started out with such great promise and hope for wealth, ended with bankruptcy, disgrace, and ultimately death. So it promises to be two exciting lectures coming up. <laughs> Um, as, a as a reminder, the format of the 8 Bells Lecture has the author speaking for about 40 to 45 minutes. Uh, the last 15 to 20 minutes are given over for questions. And books from today's lecture are on sale in the Foundation gift shop on the first floor, and there will be opportunities to have those signed at the end of the lecture. Today's presentation is on the book Athenia Torpedo Torpedoed by Dr. Francis Carroll. The British Ocean Liner Athenia was torpedoed within eight and a half hours of a British declaration of war on 3rd September 1939. This book discusses not only the dramatic rescue of 1,300 passengers, it also discusses how this event shaped policy for Britain, Canada, and the United States. The author, Dr. Francis M. Carroll, is Professor Emeritus at the University of Manitoba. He has published 10 books and is the winner of the J.W. Defoe Prize and the Albert B. Corey Prize for his work <laughs> A Good and Wise Measure, The Search for a Canadian-American Boundary, 1783 to 1842. To tell you more about the book, Athenia Torpedoed and his research, I give you Dr. Francis Carroll. Well, thank you very much. And uh, thank you very much for having me here. I'm delighted to, to get to the Naval War College Museum, which I've wanted to see for years. Uh, and uh, have, for one reason or another, not been able to make it. So, so here I am, and I'm delighted to have an opportunity to talk with you about the, uh, the Athenia uh, and its, uh, its misadventures. When I do speak about the uh, Athenia, I, I generally ask uh, if anybody in the audience has, has ever heard of it. Now, this is a, an, an unusual audience. <laughs> So I don't think I would get the, the typical response that, that that never heard of the, the sinking of this uh, ship or or any of its uh, its stories. But I see several of you have copies of the book, so this will not be a fair question. But my interest and and John Kennedy suggested that I I talk about how I came to write the book uh, for for a bit, and and so I want to do that. And and my interest arose out of curiosity in all the sort of standard works of either the naval history of the war or, or just the, uh, the outbreak of the war, uh, that uh, the kind of litany of, of events are, are, are discussed. The, the ultimatum, the, of course, Poland was invaded on the 1st of September 1939. Uh, the British government and the French government uh, tried to work out what, uh, how to respond to that. And an ultimatum was sent to the Germans on, on uh, Saturday uh, to, to expire on the 11, uh, at 11 o'clock on Sunday the 3rd of, of September. And the Germans did not respond to the ultimatum to withdraw their troops from Poland, so war broke out. And uh, <coughs> Prime Minister Neville Chamberlain goes on the uh, national radio to announce that a state of war uh, exists, and Parliament met later in the afternoon, and Winston Churchill is brought into the cabinet as First Lord of the Admiralty. Uh, and, the Athenia, and the Athenia was sunk. This is, you know, two, one or two lines uh, in the first page of, of the discussion of, of, the, uh, of, of the beginning of the war. Uh, Samuel Eliot Morrison's uh, uh, famous book, for example, has a couple of lines. Uh, Captain Stephen Roskill's uh, uh, book of the Royal Navy in, in the war uh, similarly has a couple of lines in, in, in the book. 
but no real discussion. I, I began to get curious, what was this ship, the Athenia, and uh, where was it going, and uh, who was involved? So I did a Google search, uh, and I found that there was one book on the, on the Athenia, written in 1958 and 59 by a, an Irish uh, a journalist, a uh, uh, Northern I Irish journalist, Max Caulfield. And I had read some of his work. He's also written some, uh, some history of, of Ireland. So I, I recognized the name right away and managed to get a copy of, of the book, which is very good. Uh, it's an, a very interesting and well thought out book, but it's written before all of the documents uh, were available. Uh, and it's written largely from a, a, a UK point of view, a British uh, a point of view. Uh, and I thought there must be more there. There must be another story. There's the, the, the ship was sailing from Glasgow, Belfast, and Liverpool uh, to Quebec City and, and Montreal. And, of course, it was loaded with uh, Americans and Canadians. So uh, there must be an American dimension to this uh, story as well. So uh, fate would have it, I was uh, uh, in Europe. I was giving a lecture in Germany, and I stopped in, in uh, London on the way home and spent about a week uh, at uh, what, uh, what we uh, old historians like to call the PRO, but it's now the National Archives of, of, of Britain and uh, I found quite an enormous amount of stuff in the Admiralty Papers, the Ministry of Transport Papers, the Cabinet Papers, uh, the Foreign Office Papers, uh, a, a really a wealth of, of, of very informative material. When I got back to Winnipeg, I went on my catalog of, of State Department material, and I found the State Department had five microfilm reels uh, on the Athenia. So I ordered those by interlibrary loan and got right to work on, on, on the State Department stuff. And there was a terrific amount. The State Department interviewed every American citizen that survived the, uh, the sinking of the ship uh, with the view in mind that the Athenia might become the Lusitania of the Second World War. And they wanted to find out how was the ship sunk, uh, who was involved, could the uh, uh, could the destruction be explained in legal terms? They're never really able to arrive at a legal definition of who sunk the ship. The Germans denied responsibility. The British and, and, and accused the British of sinking the ship themselves. Uh, the British uh, threw up their hands and said, well, that was completely preposterous, of course. It was clear that, that a submarine had sunk the ship, but whose submarine? So it never became the, the Lusitania <laughs> issue in World War II, but it did provide all of these wonderful records, uh, anywhere from a paragraph to five pages of witness statements, uh, hundreds of them uh, in these uh, State Department uh, records. So at that point, I, th I realized I had the, the substance of quite a good story here. Uh, the Canadian government provided me with uh, a lot of documents. The Irish government uh, uh, provided some documents. Uh, and I really began to put together a lot of material uh, to explain what had happened and how this, uh, how this crisis uh, had, had, uh, uh, had developed. Uh, I also went on Google. And of course, Google has really become a, a, a wonderful uh, search engine. Uh, and I turned up. Uh, not so much government records, of course, but personal statements, survivor accounts. Uh, Google led me to um, any number of libraries, and I was able to uh, uh, obtain documents from these libraries uh, and, and began to build up a really diverse and interesting uh, series of, of profiles of survivors. Uh, so I really had what what amounts to uh, uh, material going in two directions, the policy issues uh, and the international law issues uh, concerning uh, the, uh, the use of submarines and the sinking of civilian ships uh, and all of, the, uh, uh, all of the policy implications to uh, flow from that, uh, together with all of these survivor accounts. Uh, 112 people were killed, but an enormous number uh, were saved, and so there were a lot of uh, 
uh, harrowing experiences, uh, but a lot of survivor accounts uh, uh, as, as well. So I then really felt I had the substance uh, for a book. So I wrote a couple of articles, but uh, the book was the, uh, uh, the major effort. Uh, but anyway, I, I want to show you some pictures. Nobody's ever seen the Athenia, so I want to show you some pictures <coughs> of the Athenia. This, this is a postcard, uh, and if you uh, remember uh, steamship travel, uh, all these steamships had their postcards and stationaries, uh, and this is the, uh, a, a pre-war uh, postcard of, uh, of the Athenia, Athenia as uh, projected by the, uh, by the steamship company. The Athenia was a small kind of niche market passenger ship uh, run by the Donaldson Line out of Glasgow. Donaldson Line goes back to the 1850s, both uh, dealing with both freight and, 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 and passenger. But by the 1920s and 30s, it, uh, it really serviced the market uh, from uh, Scotland and Northern England to uh, Canada competed with the Northern Pacific, uh, or the, the Canadian Pacific steamship lines uh, operating out of southern uh, 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 England, but uh, this was a, 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 a major link between Canada and, uh, uh, and, and uh, the UK. They had two passenger ships, uh, the Athenia here and uh, its sister ship, uh, the Letitia. They were both built in 1923. Uh, were capable of carrying about 1,400 passengers, never carried that many as far as I can, uh, I can, I can make out. Um, this is the Athenia on the Clyde, uh, which was its uh, home, uh, uh, Glasgow was its home port. I think that, uh, that the two ships in the background are the Cameronia and the Transylvania, uh, but I, I, I could be wrong uh, about that. Um, the the uh, the information, uh, this is actually a still from a, a, a motion picture, uh, and the information associated with it's a little uh, uh, vague. When it's, it, it picked up passengers uh, in Glasgow uh, on the 1st of September and sailed at about noon uh, and went uh, down the Clyde and out across the Irish Sea to uh, Belfast and in Belfast Lock uh, picked up um, uh, more passengers later in the evening uh, and then overnight sailed to Liverpool uh, and, and began taking on passengers at about noon uh, in Liverpool and sailed at about 4.30 uh, in the afternoon. Went out around the Isle of Man and up through the Irish Sea in the North Channel and um, was just southwest of Rock Hall Bank uh, on uh, the early evening, late afternoon of Sunday, September 3. Uh, and whoops, I've got to uh, well, uh, where, it, where it encountered uh, the German submarine, the U-30. Uh, and uh, this was the kind of workhorse submarine, was a, 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 a Type 7 uh, submarine. Uh, that had sailed from Willemshaven uh, on about the 19th of August. A number of, of, of submarines sortied uh, within days of each other to get on station uh, around the British Isles and, and northern France uh, in the event that war broke out. And uh, as, as it did on, on, on Sunday the 3rd and by the mid-afternoon, uh, all these submarines received radio messages to in, engage uh, the enemy. Uh, and um, the, uh, the skipper of the, uh, of the submarine was uh, 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 Lieutenant uh, uh, Fritz Julius Lemp, uh, who's seen here uh, with uh, Admiral Donuts. Uh, the, I, I, this I think this photograph is August of, of 1940 uh, when Lemp was given the Knight's Cross. He was given a, a, an Iron Cross in October of 1939 and a, 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 the next uh, rank uh, in January of, of, of 1940 and by the summer of 1940 was uh, given the Knight's uh, Cross. So he was one of the uh, one of the really uh, outstanding uh, 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 submarine uh, uh, commanders, um, he 
sunk uh, at least 17 or 19 ships. So he had a very uh, uh, strong record. But uh, in addition to creating problems with the sinking of the Athenia, he was also uh, commander of, uh, of the U-110. Uh, does that, anybody recognize the U-110? The U-110 was the, uh, the submarine uh, that was forced to the surface. And he ordered the crew to abandon ship and the uh, uh, um, uh, a party from HMS Bulldog uh, went on board and got the code books, which was, of course, an enormous breakthrough uh, for reading the uh, 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 German uh, naval, co uh, naval code, uh, the Enigma naval code. Uh, so Lem was a mixed blessing for the Germans uh, in, in, in several uh, uh, respects. Uh, Here's the ship uh, just before it uh, went under. Photograph taken on Monday morning, uh, the 4th of September. The ship sank at about 11 o'clock, sometime between uh, 10 and, and, and 11. But there are a couple of photographs. This is the best one uh, of it uh, that, I, that, I have, uh, that I have found. But everybody got off. Everybody who was alive got off the ship. Um, and you can see the... Uh, uh, the uh, uh, lines fr from the, the, the davits uh, uh, along the side of the ship. Um, so by this time, uh, the, the lifeboats had, uh, uh, had got away, uh, and uh, most of the survivors were, had been picked up uh, by various uh, um, uh, relief ships that, uh, that were able to get over to it. But the news of the sinking of the ship spread around the, the, certainly the English-speaking world uh, immediately. Uh, the New York Times had uh, had uh, very large headlines, but all the all the other newspapers in in Great Britain and Canada and the United States. Uh, uh, this was the uh, Poland was a long way away, but North Atlantic uh, travel uh, affected everyone, uh, certainly on on the, in in the coastal areas. Uh, so the uh, the newspapers uh, all covered the, the sinking of the ship. Um, the weeklies, like Life magazine, uh, had, had uh, special articles about it as well. I was uh, amazed to find that, that Life magazine, the leading uh, 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 photo uh, magazine, didn't have any, any, any pictures of the ship, uh, but they commissioned somebody to do this elaborate uh, drawing of the sinking of, of the Athenium. Uh, I, I suspect the royalty fees were too high for the photographs or something, but <laughs> uh, this, this turns up in, in the uh, uh, September 13, I think, uh, issue of, of uh, Life magazine. But uh, one of the real stories here is the, the relief effort, and uh, uh, several ships were involved in that. This is a picture of the uh, uh, Knut Nelson, uh, owned by the uh, Norwegian uh, uh, shipping firm uh, Fred Olsen uh, and Company, uh, and it had uh, it had seen the uh, the U-boat uh, on uh, running on the surface uh, earlier on on Sunday morning before a, a war broke out. So it was really only about uh, uh, six seven hours steaming uh, distance uh, from the uh, uh, from the Athenian. It arrived. Uh, at the scene uh, just a little after midnight and, and began taking on uh, passengers and, and in fact picked up some 430 uh, um, survivors. Uh, a second vessel was the, uh, the steam yacht uh, Southern Cross, which as fate would have it was the, the largest private steam yacht uh, in the world at the time. It was owned by uh, a man by the name of, of Axel Wenner Gren, uh, who was the, uh, the, the head of the Electrolux company and who also had interests in, in uh, Saab and uh, Bofors. So here was this, this, this Swedish, this wealthy Swedish uh, uh, multimillionaire with his American wife uh, who, who also got to the scene of the Athenia uh, uh, shortly after uh, uh, midnight and began taking on uh, survivors as well. Some 376 uh, were, uh, were picked up by the, uh, 
by the Southern Cross. And three Royal Navy destroyers were uh, uh, detached from escort duty uh, and, uh, and, and sent from the Scottish coast. And they arrived early in the morning, just about uh, first light. Um, um, and this is, um, uh, this is HMS Electra, but uh, uh, both um, uh, HMS Escort and HMS Fame also uh, uh, assisted. The Electra was an E-class uh, destroyer built in 1934 uh, and had a, a really interesting and distinguished uh, 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 history. Uh, later, um, uh, Electra was one of the escorts uh, for HMS Hood. Uh, in that disaster, and it was Electra that picked up the three survivors uh, of the sinking of uh, HMS Hood in May of 1941. Uh, it was then sent out later as a, a, a escorting a, a HMS Prince of Wales and, and Repulse uh, and uh, picked up survivors uh, when those uh, uh, two ships were, were sunk in the, in the South uh, China Sea. Uh, but it uh, was later lost uh, in the Battle of, uh, of the Java Sea in February of, of 1942. Uh, the uh, the uh, uh, Electra picked up 238 people and the uh, uh, escort uh, 403, and they brought their survivors into, uh, uh, into Glasgow. So, the survivors began coming into a variety of ports. The, the Norwegian uh, ship, uh, Norway had declared its neutrality, uh, and they wanted to send the, their, uh, their ship into a neutral port, so they went into Galway. Uh, and uh, uh, here you see the tender uh, that picked people up uh, from the Knut Nelson and brought them into Galway. And Galway provided absolutely wonderful uh, hospitality. Uh, for uh, the survivors there, who were in an absolutely distraught stage. Many, many of the people were in bed because they were seasick, others were at dinner. There were lots of children on board the ship. Uh, so the, the, the pictures of the survivors in distress um, coming into uh, a Galway are, 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 are really uh, something. Uh, the destroyers brought uh, their survivors into Glasgow. Uh, and um, uh, Glasgow also uh, uh, provided uh, wonderful hospitality, uh, but uh, the, uh, the ambassador to Great Britain, of course, in, in 1939 was uh, Joseph P. Kennedy. Uh, and Kennedy was bombarded with Americans trying to get back to uh, the United States, and so he was completely preoccupied. Uh, uh, with that problem. So he sent his 22-year-old his, um, son, John F. Kennedy, up to Glasgow uh, to look after the American survivors uh, there. And uh, here you see him uh, with um, the, uh, the, the mayor of, of uh, Glasgow, the Lord Provost, uh, 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 John Dolan, uh, and several of the, of the survivors. Uh, and here he is with the uh, U.S. Consul General, uh, uh, Leslie uh, uh, Davis. Um, and he was, a, he was a great success. I mean, there's a whole lot of mythology that surrounds John F. Kennedy, which we historians sometimes uh, raise a cynical uh, eye about. But in fact, he was terrific uh, in, in easing people's <coughs> minds and reassuring them that they were going to be looked after and, 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 uh, and thanking the, the Glasgow uh, uh, authorities, uh, he charmed everyone, which is really a, 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 a delightful uh, story. Now, another vessel that, uh, that was involved in all of this was the American freighter, the City of Flint, a U.S. Maritime Commission uh, vessel, uh, the, the City of Flint. And uh, it has a tangled history in all of this in that uh, uh, it was uh, under some pressure from Ambassador Kennedy uh, it was already taking some 29 civilians, was not fitted for uh, uh, passengers, and so they had to build bunks uh, in the shelter deck uh, out of lumber in the, the, the ship's stores, uh, and they, they got some extra supplies uh, to deal with these, these passengers, uh, and they put to sea, uh, but they picked up the uh, uh, the, dis the distress signal of the Athenia, and went back, and they took the passengers uh, from the uh, 
the, the, the Southern Cross, uh, they took all of the survivors who wanted to go on to North America. Uh, and um, so they, they picked up all together uh, 236 uh, survivors. So they had to make a whole lot more bunks uh, out, of, out of timber uh, in, the, uh, in, in the shelter deck. Uh, and they got more food from several other vessels uh, that they met on the way. Uh, but it's a, it's a marvelous story. The captain of the, of the city of Flint was uh, uh, Joseph Gaynard, who wrote a, a wonderful memoir uh, called The y Yankee Skipper. Uh, and uh, the, the city of Flint had several adventures. After it got back to uh, the United States and uh, discharged its cargo and picked up a new cargo and headed off into uh, the North Atlantic once again for the UK, it was stopped and boarded by a prize crew from the, uh, the German uh, pocket battleship Deutschland. And they sailed the uh, city of Flint uh, toward Germany, but they put into Norway and then put into Murmansk. Uh, and not until they were coming back down along the Norwegian coast did the Norwegian uh, authorities I intervene and, and turn the ship back over to uh, Captain Gaynard. Uh, who could then bring it back t uh, to the United States. So this was a, uh, uh, a, a ship which had a lot of uh, adventures. Uh, the, the U.S. Uh, government, in response to all of this, sent out uh, uh, two uh, Coast Guard cutters, the, uh, uh, the, the, uh, the Bibb and, uh, um, and the Campbell, the George M. Bibb and the George W. Campbell to escort the, uh, uh, the city of Flint into Halifax. Uh, and uh, h here is a picture w at the dock uh, in Halifax. In the, in the book, I have a picture of a mounted policeman escorting someone down the, uh, the, the, the gangplank. But this was a major uh, event. On the 13th of September, uh, the, uh, the city of Flint brought the first Athenian survivors back to North America. Um, now, the city of Flint, or pardon me, the, the Athenia was not one of the glamour vessels, so it did not have uh, all kinds of, uh, uh, of movie stars and politicians and, and uh, uh, the, 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 the sort of uh, uh, glamorous people that might be expected uh, in uh, uh, a transatlantic voyage. But I've got a couple of people I want to point out to you. Uh, this is Judith uh, Evelyn, uh, a, a, an aspiring actress. Um, and you might remember her uh, as Miss Lonely Hearts in uh, Rear Window. Uh, she had a, by that time she was a little past it and was, and, and was getting a kind of a, a bit parts. Uh, but she had quite a successful career and in 1941 won the, uh, uh, the Drama League Award in, in, in New York playing opposite Vincent Price uh, in uh, 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 Angel Street, which was later made into a movie uh, called Gaslight, and, and Ingrid Bergman played the part in the movie. But Judith Evelyn was the, uh, the, the star in the Broadway uh, production. If you're, uh, if you're World War II buffs and, and are keen on, on, uh, on the air war, you might recognize uh, this figure, uh, uh, James A. Goodson, or Goody Goodson. Does that name ring a bell? Goody Goodson shot, uh, destroyed about 30 uh, uh, German planes uh, <coughs> before he was shot down himself. Uh, but he was a young man uh, on, the, on the Athenia and, and, and uh, very heroically helped rescue people in the uh, damaged parts uh, of, of the ship got back to the United States and, and, and Canada and went up to the University of Toronto and had a year at the University of Toronto but got into the officer candidate uh, uh, school uh, attached to the University of Toronto and got his, uh, uh, his pilot's wings uh, in the Canadian Air Force and then flew uh, with the Eagle Squadron uh, in, uh, in England and after the United States came into the war uh, he, uh, he transferred to the uh, Army Air Force. Uh, so he had quite an interesting uh, 
uh, uh, record came out of the war, a, a, a lieutenant colonel, um, and uh, here you see him in the cockpit of uh, one of his planes. Uh, this is a group of uh, four, or pardon me, three of, of 18 uh, uh, college girls from uh, the University of Texas. Uh, in, uh, you know, as, as just as today, a, a lot of college students went to Europe for the summer. And this was a kind of package tour. All these girls uh, were, were um, schoolmates uh, from a school in Texas, as well as uh, 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 classmates at, at the University of Texas. Uh, and they were split up between those sailing on the Athenia and those sailing on the city of Flint. So it was a tremendous reunion when the survivors of the Athenia were taken on board the, uh, uh, the, the, the city of Flint. Uh, the girl on the, uh, on, the, on the left is Rowena Simpson, whose family papers were uh, deposited at uh, the public library in, in Houston, in the, uh, the Texas uh, collection uh, in Houston. So I was able to get into her papers, which gave me an insight into uh, all of these girls and the, uh, uh, the experiences they had, uh, which, was, uh, which was great fun for me. And this, uh, uh, this is another uh, uh, Hollywood figure. The man on, on the left is Ernst Lubitsch, the, uh, the film director. Uh, and uh, uh, in my estimation, he's probably, his most famous film would be Nonachka, uh, which you can see on Turner Classic Movies from time to time. But he did a lot of things. He had a long history of film directing in Germany. Um, and in one of his famous films was the early version of The Merry Widow. Um, the, he's holding there uh, his, his infant daughter, Nicola. Nicola and her nurse, uh, uh, Carlina uh, Stromer, uh, were on the Athenia. And uh, uh, Carlina Stromer uh, got great credit for looking after the infant girl and, and protecting her and getting her into the lifeboat and uh, bringing her back uh, uh, safe, and, safe and sound. So these are uh, some of the images uh, that, uh, uh, that give you some picture of the, of the story of the ship. But they don't deal with the question that I raise kind of by implication in my opening remarks as, as to why nobody has ever heard of, this, of the Athenia and its sinking. Is it just a footnote to history uh, or is there some importance? Uh, to, the, uh, to the sinking of the Athenia, uh, uh, qu quite apart from the, the survivor stories uh, and all these interesting uh, uh, incidents. So what I'd like to also do uh, this morning is give you just a, a, a couple of statements about what seemed to me to be the, uh, uh, the importance of the, si the sinking of the Athenia. Uh, for one thing, in the US, it rallied opinion uh, about the, uh, the threat of war. President Roosevelt had tried to get the neutrality legislation uh, amended in the summer of 1939 and couldn't get the votes to do it. So he reconvened uh, uh, Congress um, in late September uh, and uh, by uh, November uh, was able to have the neutrality legislation amended to allow for the cash and carry of munitions. Uh, previous legislation had put an arms embargo on, on belligerents. And in, in the, the uh, amended legislation, uh, it was possible for the, um, um, uh, for the United States to sell munitions to the British and French. Uh, in the crisis also, he opened his correspondence with, uh, with Churchill. He telephoned uh, Winston Churchill, and so the, the beginning of that unique relationship between FDR and Winston Churchill really gets started uh, in the aftermath of, of the, the Athenia and the Iroquois uh, uh, incident. So I think in, 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 in a very real way, this is the first step to making the United States the arsenal of democracy, to use Roosevelt's phrase uh, about, a, about a year later. In Canada, it had a, a powerful uh, 
uh, public opinion effect as well in pushing a reluctant population uh, to support the war. Uh, it brought the war home. All the Canadians involved in the, uh, in, in the sinking of the ship uh, suggested that this just was not just another European war, another British war. Uh, and uh, so the, uh, in, the, in, the, in the war declaration debate, in the debate over the, the measure to go to war, uh, the issue of the uh, uh, Athenia was, was raised. Uh, the, the, the Prime Minister's uh, Quebec uh, Lieutenant Ernst Lapointe, uh, speaking to Parliament uh, with the reluctant French population uh, in mind, said specifically, some say we are not interested. People were saying that last Sunday, at the very moment an enemy submarine was torpedoing the liner Athenia, which was carrying over 500 Canadian passengers who might have lost their lives. And the, one of the opposition uh, figures in, 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 in the debate said also, I say we owe a, a duty to those passengers tonight. Uh, and so on the 8th of, uh, of um, of September on Saturday the 8th, the uh, war measure was passed, and on Sunday the 9th of September, Canada went to war. Now in Britain, I think it's fair to say the the impact was uh, was the greatest. Uh, Churchill, as you remember, had come in as uh, First Lord of the Admiralty on Sunday uh, itself. Uh, he he uh, 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 informed the cabinet the following uh, morning and the, the uh, House of Commons uh, later in the afternoon. But working with his uh, staff at the uh, Admiralty office, uh, he began putting together uh, what would be the convoy program uh, uh, for, for, the, for the war. Several other ships were sunk in close succession. Uh, the freighters uh, Blair Logie, Bosnia, Royal Scepter, and uh, Rio Clara. Uh, and it seemed to, uh, to Churchill and, and, and several other people that the, the Germans had reverted to unrestricted submarine warfare on the first day of the war. That was not actually the case, but the fact that all of these submarines were off the coast uh, and, and actually sinking ships uh, convinced many people that, that the 1918 situation uh, had, uh, had, uh, had come back. And so by <coughs> Wednesday evening, uh, that first week of the war, the decision was made at the Admiralty office uh, to go to convoys uh, the following day on the, on the um, 7th of September. All merchant ships leaving uh, the Thames or the Mersey uh, or uh, the Firth of Forth and all ships uh, uh, sailing along the east coast of, uh, of, of, of Britain would sail in convoys. Exceptions were made for vessels uh, who could s steam in excess of 50 knots or who sailed under uh, uh, nine knots. But this was really the beginning of the the convoy policy. Uh, Churchill, in his memoirs, uh, writes that uh, this uh, talking about the earlier plans to phase in convoys uh, uh, really in the uh, uh, in the English Channel in the North Sea, uh, he writes in his memoirs, the, the sinking of the Athenia upset those plans, and we adopted the convoy in the North Atlantic forthwith. Other implications uh, were also that, um, that it pushed Churchill uh, and, the, uh, and the Admiralty to, uh, uh, to begin to build uh, escort vessels as fast as they could. Churchill accelerated the construction of destroyers, uh, pushed the Hunt class destroyers uh, into a, a, a rapid uh, uh, construction and pushed the uh, development of a, uh, a, a vessel based on a Norwegian whaler, uh, which became the, uh, uh, the, the flower class corvette uh, because they could be built in small shipyards. And uh, uh, in 1940 and 41, over 100 uh, 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 flower class corvettes were built um, in the, the UK and Canada, uh, and by um, and they were they were equipped, as I'm sure you know, with uh, either four or either three or four inch guns uh, with depth charges, uh, with um, uh, sonar and later with radar. Uh, and by 1943, a larger uh, 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 castle class um, uh, corvette was uh, was put forward as well. And I think it's not too 
much of a, a stretch to say that the, uh, the building of destroyer escorts uh, in the United States was a direct uh, follow-up from the need to have a lot of escort vessels. Uh, and so U U.S. construction of, of destroyer escorts brought vessels into, uh, into commission by late 1942, uh, and, and they were built right up until the, the, end of the, the end of the war. So I think in a, in, in a fascinating way, the, uh, the, uh, uh, the sinking of the Athenia uh, had profound effects. It was not just a, a footnote uh, to uh, <laughs> the history of the war, not just a, a series of interesting survivor accounts. Uh, in terms of, of cementing the link between uh, 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 Roosevelt and Churchill, in terms of shifting the arms embargo to a cash and carry policy uh, in the U.S. and in Canada, helping to build unity uh, <coughs> to uh, achieve a, 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 a heavily supported declaration of war. Uh, in, in the UK, uh, moving immediately to convoys. Remember, in the First World War, uh, convoys weren't uh, uh, implemented until uh, June of 1917. So to go immediately to convoys was a major uh, step, uh, and the building of escort uh, vessels um, uh, to service the uh, uh, the convoys give give the Athenia, I think, a uh, a prominent place in, in my judgment. In any case, well, anyway, that's my story of the Athenia. <coughs> I hope uh, you've uh, found it uh, <laughs> interesting and useful. <laughs> Yes, I understand questions are, uh, are, are available. I'm delighted to answer any. Why did the Germans do it after the Lusitania? There's no really good explanation, but I think it's probably fair to say that, that Fritz Julius Lemp gets the, uh, the, uh, uh, the instructions to commence hostilities. Uh, and he's aware of the uh, international law uh, the, the London Naval, the, the submarine protocol of the London Naval Treaty, but he'd, uh, all of these skippers had been warned by donuts before they sailed to beware of armed merchant cruisers. And what he saw coming across the water south of, of, of Rockall Bank was this fast moving 16 knots uh, uh, passenger ship all blacked out and uh, zigzagging in anti-submarine uh, uh, formation, and he suspected this was a, uh, uh, an armed merchant cruiser. Uh, and only after he began to see hundreds of people streaming off the side of the ship did he go down uh, to the radio room and, and check uh, uh, Lloyd's registry of ships, uh, where his radio operator told him also that that the, uh, the, the distress signals were being sent in the clear uh, by the Athenia. Uh, only at that point did he realize that he'd sunk a, uh, uh, a passenger ship. But he also fired four torpedoes. Uh, so he was certainly going to make sure that, uh, that he sunk the vessel. Uh, and the passengers, although the German records don't reveal this, the passengers all claim that a deck gun was fired at least once, perhaps twice. So it's, it's difficult to know uh, quite what happened. He was mildly reprimanded when he got back to Germany, uh, but by that time he'd, he'd sunk four ships. He'd rescued um, two British pilots, and he landed the two British pilots and uh, uh, an injured crew member in Iceland. Uh, he'd been under uh, a destroyer attack, uh, taken the, uh, the submarine way down to 400 and some feet, and limped back to Germany with only one engine running. So he was, he was the kind of submarine commander they wanted. They couldn't very well reprimand him, I suppose. So they denied the fact that they'd sunk the ship at all. Yes. So there was no advance warning? From no, no, none. Did the uh, Nazi subs stay around uh, after the sinking uh, to make an attempt to uh, sink any of the rescue boats? No, you know? they didn't. And uh, 
and and in his subsequent uh, attacks, he uh, he made he tried to make some provision for the survivors, but he didn't do that in the, in the case of the Athenia, which is kind of puzzling. Whatever happened to him? Did he uh, survive the war? No. Well, he was he was drowned in when when the U uh, one ten was uh, uh, uh -huh. uh, forced to the surface, and they think he may have drowned sw trying to swim back to the submarine when he saw that HMS Bulldog was putting a, 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 a boat uh, uh, on board, uh, but nobody knows. They did save uh, much of the crew, but not, not Lemp. Where did you get the German records? From the, uh, uh, the war crimes. Uh, uh, the, 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 the testimony of the Nuremberg war crimes trials. I, I, uh, I don't read German, so I, I was uh, uh, limited in what kind of German archives I could find, but the war crimes trials and Admiral Donis's memoirs and a number of, um, of, of journal articles gave me a pretty good picture of what, uh, what, what the, how the Germans viewed uh, all of this. Did uh, uh, you mention that uh, Yes, I did. And amazingly, there, well, I suppose not so amazingly, there were several people in Manitoba. I live in Winnipeg, uh, and uh, uh, the, 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 uh, an elderly doctor, he and his three brothers and father uh, were, were young boys. It was a French family, and they'd gone back to France to visit the grandparents, uh, and um, they, uh, they were on the, uh, they, they were on the Athenia, uh, and the, this family all had an interesting uh, uh, career. One of the brothers uh, became a, a successful businessman and a, a, a politician, the leader of the Liberal Party in Manitoba, elected to uh, 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 Parliament in Ottawa, and then appointed to the, uh, to the Senate. And another became a diplomat. Uh, and this, uh, the brother that I talked to, the last living brother, was a, uh, a surgeon uh, in uh, one of the Winnipeg hospitals. And I had a very interesting uh, conversation with him. And there were two young boys from rural Manitoba uh, with their mother, uh, and they had been in Scotland. Uh, and both of these two brothers are, are still alive, and I was able to interview one of them. Uh, and he was very, uh, uh, he was pleased to come to the book launch we had in Winnipeg, which was wonderful. He and his wife and two daughters uh, came to the, to the book launch. And the, uh, the wife of, of, of Dr. Andre Mulgat, Dr. Andre is getting a little uh, frail, but his wife came and the widow of one of his brothers came and, and all the rest of their family came to the book launch. So that was very, very nice. But I also corresponded with a number of of people, both in, in Canada and the U.S. Uh, and in the U.K. Uh, so I did have some contact with, uh, with survivors, which was th the first time I've ever uh, had that opportunity, so that was really, uh, really fun. The, the pictures I have in the book of, um, of uh, uh, James Goodson I got from his daughter, and I had nice correspondence with uh, with his daughter, and she was very gracious in letting me use uh, uh, some of her uh, family photos for the, for the book. Yes? The submarine that, that sank the Athena, it survived the war and then it was scuttled at the end? Is that yes. Why, That's would it, why would they have scuttled it? Can't answer that. Yeah, D don't know. In fact, there are two stories as to what happened, but I th uh, I've gone with the scuttled <laughs> story. Uh, one is that it was hit in in, in uh, submarine pens in the, uh, in the in the in the Baltic, but I, the, the, I, I my so, my source about its being scuttled seems somewhat more reliable. So that's. Did it serve throughout the war? It it was taken out of active duty and used for training, if I remember, okay. which was why it was in the Baltic uh, uh, as as well. Yeah. How long were the survivors in the water before 8 came? Well, the first, the first lifeboats got in the water just about a little after 8 o'clock. And the, uh, the, the timing is very, of course, people's watches got filled with water, but uh, 
Uh, so the, 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 the times people gave in their testimonies tend to be a little <laughs> erratic, but just sometime after midnight, the first lifeboats were being picked up, but they were still being picked up at, uh, at, at first light in the morning when the, uh, uh, the, when the destroyers arrived. So it really went on all night. People could have easily been in the, in the water for 10 hours. Those that were dead, were they killed by the explosions on the ship? Or well, a number were killed by the explosion. And, and I think a, a number of crew, uh, because it hit the engine room and the, and the galley, uh, and so a number of crew were killed um, uh, when, when the torpedo hit. Uh, there, were, there were two accidents in launching the uh, lifeboats. Uh, the, uh, the, the falls ran wild and, and the boats didn't go down. Uh, even a number of people spilled out. Uh, and then there was a terrible accident with the uh, Knut Nelson, the Knut El Nelson. Uh, turned on its engine and it was riding empty as you could see in the picture and so one of the lifeboats was sliced by the propeller and, and, and several people were, were killed outright and others were drowned. And then a second lifeboat was, uh, was caught by the fantail. You, you couldn't see it in my picture of, um, of the Southern Cross but it had a, a, a long uh, uh, fantail extending o out, o out over the stern of the, the, the vessel. And in what by then were about eight to ten foot waves, a lifeboat got caught and flipped over. And uh, this, uh, these two boys and their mother uh, that, I, that I mentioned from, uh, from Manitoba were in that boat and were thrown into the water. Uh, and the crew of the Southern Cross were heroic in, in getting into the water themselves to rescue these people, but not everyone was uh, saved. Uh, my, my two Manitoba boys and their mother uh, were saved, but they were brought in by, uh, uh, by different people. So the mother was frantic to find her, uh, her two children who were warming themselves in the engine room. <laughs> so the story had a happy ending, but, but uh, uh, this guy, Scotty Gillespie, told me his mother would never talk about these experiences. They, they the two boys uh, thought it was a great adventure, but the mother would never talk about it. <laughs> Yes. Did, did any part of Churchill's speech uh, to rouse the public uh, get preserved as one of his great uh, icons? I don't think he talked about the uh, he, he, he talked about the um, the Athena in in Parliament that first week of the war, kind of giving updates as to uh, what had happened. Uh, but I don't think he gave any other of the big public speeches. Uh, or I, I would have I would have tracked that down. I, I made a, an elaborate search, as you might imagine, of, 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 of Churchill remarks, and the, the Churchill uh, cabinet papers have come out, which include a lot of his speeches uh, uh, as well. Uh, so I was I was delighted to find the one phrase in the in the war memoirs where he talks about uh, the Athena shaping the convoy policy. Vaguely remember in the back of my mind, there was a child who died. Yes. En route. Yes. And there was a big to do of it. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, a, a ten year old girl by the name of Margaret Hayworth uh, was hit by uh, some shrapnel when the, uh, when the torpedo exploded. She and her mother and her sister were on deck. Uh, and uh, the explosion came up through one of the hatch, uh, uh, one of the hatches, and so even people on deck were uh, were injured. Uh, and uh, this uh, young girl got a, a, a gash in her forehead, and, and obviously much more serious uh, uh, damage as well. And th there's a poignant story there that the mother is getting the herself and and her daughter into the lifeboat. And the other daughter was holding on to the mother's skirt and lost her grip. And so the mother got into the lifeboat. And then she called for her daughter. And somebody handed a different child over the side of the boat into the lifeboat. So the other daughter was left on the, uh, on the, on the ship. Uh, and she survived, got home by other means. Uh, but th this distraught mother with an in injured child in one hand and a missing child on the other. 
uh, and I found the uh, uh, the uh, account of the of the second child, Jacqueline, uh, in a Toronto newspaper. So I got the the other part of the story, which I was very grateful for. But the Margaret Hayworth died on on shipboard. There was a doctor among the survivors, and they worked very hard to try to save her. And uh, another passenger liner. Uh, uh, stopped and sent their ship's doctor on board, and they, the two doctors worked together, uh, but uh, Margaret Hayworth died. And so uh, rather than being buried at sea, she was brought back to, to Halifax. Family was from Hamilton, Ontario, and an enormous funeral was, was held. And the, 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 the premier of the province, uh, the, the, all of the local officials, a representative of the federal government came. So it became a, a kind of Canadian national uh, 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 event. And, and really, Margaret Hayworth symbolized the, uh, all of the other Canadians who were, who were killed uh, and the fact that the war had really come to Canada uh, to begin with. I like to say that, in fact, you know, the, the, the war came to the United States. A lot of Americans died. Uh, a lot of Canadians uh, and other people as well. This is really, these are the first Americans killed in World War II, as well as the first Brits and, and, and the first uh, Canadians. Yes? Were any German uh, submariners interviewed? The, uh, the, the guy who had been put ashore in Iceland was, when, when, when Denmark was, was, was overrun by the Germans, the British um, occupied Denmark. And so this guy was made a prisoner of war. In, with, Iceland. Or Iceland, yeah. Uh, this guy was made a prisoner of war and, and sent off to Lethbridge, Alberta. Uh, and uh, he, uh, he wrote some accounts after the war. So I've seen stuff that he's, he'd written after the war. Uh, I don't know that anybody else was interviewed uh, from from that German crew. They were all sworn to secrecy uh, by the by the government, as was this uh, this man on, uh, who who said that once Germany was defeated and he was. Uh, uh, I, I'm, I'm subpoenaed wouldn't be the right word, but the, the, the government figured out who were Athena's survivors, British government, and so they contacted him, and he then uh, gave testimony for the war crimes trial. And that's a very interesting story too. The going over the uh, the logbook of the uh, uh, U-30 after the war in preparations for the war crimes trials they saw that the page in the submarine's logbook for 3 September uh, was not the same as all the other pages. And the entries were, they were either written in a different script or they were typed on a different typewriter. So it was clearly not part of the continuity of, of, of the logbook. And that really roused suspicions that, that the, the, the logbook had been forged, as in fact it was. Well, thank you very much for coming. And we'll see you.